Welcome to Christ the Center, your weekly conversation of Reformed theology. By my count, we're on episode number 798, and I'm delighted to be back with you today. My name is Camden Busey. I'm in Libertyville, Illinois, here at the Reformed Forum headquarters, and I have uh, two brothers with me today to talk about a fun topic. We're going to be speaking about evangelism, and specifically about the Boardwalk Chapel. And to do so, we have first, let me introduce to you, Jim Cesaro, who serves as a pastor of Christ the King, OPC, in Cape May, New Jersey, as well as a director of the Boardwalk Chapel there in Wildwood on the Boardwalk. Welcome, Jim. It's good to see you today. How are you doing? Great. So thankful that you could have us and we can make this time today. Yeah. Well, thanks for joining me. We really appreciate it. I'm looking forward to our conversation today. And uh, we also have with us Chris Bird, who serves as Evangelist of Grace, OPC in Westfield, New Jersey. He serves alongside uh, Tim Ferguson, who serves as the pastor of that congregation. Welcome, Chris. It's good to see you too. It's good to be here. Yeah. Thanks for having us, Camden. You bet. It's uh, my pleasure. So well, Chris and I have had a few moments to, to catch up and talk a bit. We crossed paths, if I'm not mistaken. I met you, Chris, and your brother, Matt, uh, your twin, uh, at, yeah. at, at uh, French Creek. French Creek. <laughs> French Creek Battle Conference in 2008, so, I think it yeah, was. Yeah, another OPC like institution. That. <laughs> uh, you know, I was, yeah. a, a, I wouldn't know, even know if I was an intern at the time. I think that was the year before I was an intern at Calvary in, in Glenside. Mm. But wow, that, that place, I think, uh, obviously is a tremendous place. It's a summer camp, uh, held for all different ages. They have different camps in different weeks throughout the summer. We were there for mm. a high school group, but, um, it's certainly in the running, if not the leading, uh, cause of OPC marriages. Yeah. <laughs> I think the chapel is a, is a second, but uh, yeah. Who knows? Who French knows? probably takes the cake. I don't know. Yeah. Hey, it could be worse, right? Like my kids are getting to the age. I think my nephews uh, have, have attended now. Uh, they're grade schoolers. I'm, I'm hoping this coming year or the year after, whatever, to send my kids. So let's start, we're going to start the, uh, start them young and, and uh, hopefully it'll lead into friendships, uh, no doubt in the OPC. With, yeah. uh, it's a good thing. I know there are several other camps out there. Uh, in the OP and many other Reformed and Presbyterian denominations have similar ministries. But today we're talking about a special one that, uh, at least by my count, began has been ministering every summer since 1945 on the New Jersey boardwalk there in Wildwood. Uh, it's a, an interesting place. Uh, I was telling the brothers that I, I've been to the boardwalk uh, chapel, but not during the season. It was uh, early spring, very cold. It was just me, my wife, and some seagulls eating some leftover French fries. And, uh, you know, it's it's quite an interesting place and a place, obviously, among others, that really needs the gospel and provides for a unique opportunity uh, for sharing the gospel uh, with those in need. Um, a lot of people aren't there. to They're not there to go to church, uh, but certainly as they walk by, certainly can hear uh, the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ proclaimed. But I'd like to start uh, with you, Jim. Maybe you can speak a bit about your involvement with the with the chapel and how you first got started. And Chris, of course, you could pitch in uh, and, and talk about your involvement as well. You both have unique ministries, but I'd love, Jim, for you to provide us a little bit of a just an overview, perhaps, and how you were first introduced uh, to the chapel. Sure. Um, it's interesting that I've been going to the Boardwalk Chapel since, well, to the Boardwalk in Wildwood, I should yeah. say. Since the summer of 1967, my great grandparents had a place in Wildwood, my dad, my uncles, they still have places today. The oddity is I never knew the chapel existed. So I probably walked by it hundreds of times <laughs> throughout my life, just yeah. going up and down the boardwalk two weeks every summer vacation until I was graduating from Bible college. I went to Northeastern Bible College in um, northern New Jersey. And that summer that I was graduating, I happened to walk by the chapel and I met a guy, um, Stanley Mansfield, who was up at our Fairlawn OP church and was talking to him outside of it a little bit. N- nothing big, not a whole lot. He just said that he was a student at Westminster Seminary. I said, oh, I'll, I'm starting at Westminster in September. So we talked for a few moments. And that's all I knew about the chapel. It kind of went out of my brain, didn't think much of it. And my first year at Westminster, it was 90 into 91. Um, I was planning on going to the military chaplaincy. I wanted to be a, a military chaplain. I had been approved by the army. So I was planning on going to chaplain officer basic that summer. And the denomination I was in was 
quite liberal and they gave me a one question theology exam to see if I would make it as a chaplain. I was, what do I think of women in ministry? And I, you know, tried to be very gracious. Like as yeah. an army chaplain, I got to deal with Muslim chaplains, all other kinds of things. I could deal with other women being there. But if you're asking me, does the Bible support mm-hmm. that? I say, no, it doesn't. Um, it does not allow for women to be ministers. And on that basis, they would not endorse me to be a chaplain. So I was looking for a summer ministry happened to see a sign for it in Westminster's in the um in the mail room kind of there um about what they were doing at the at the chapel and and opportunities there so i just got in touch with them i said i go to wildwood every summer i know people there um would have done youth ministry for like four or five years before that so i was looking forward to that um got in touch they said yeah come on down so it's the summer of 1991 i went down as a seminarian with three other two two other students from westminster were going with me at the same time mm-hmm. um and that kind of started off i i fell in love with the ministry mm-hmm. and during that um started teaching some apologetics there came back the next summer um and actually joined the local op church what was at that time it was calvary opc wildwood So I joined the church and joined the OPC. Um, They started to let me do a little bit more in terms of apologetics. I liked what I did the first summer. So I did some more training for the staff and apologetics came back that summer. I, at the end of the summer, I started dating the woman who would be my wife. She, she had been there the first two summers with me on staff there. See, it works. And yeah, it does. (laughs) And The third summer, I when I graduated Westminster in 93, I came back one more summer before doing a, a year-long internship, um, and I came back married then and was doing even more apologetics. So that kind of – that became my big ministry at the chapel was doing apologetics. The next summer, I was there only for a week. I was doing an internship at the Pole Tavern OP Church in New Jersey, and I led a youth group there. First time they had ever sent a youth group. And then they kept got that going for about 20 something years. That church kept sending a youth group. The next summer I was back as the pastor of Calvary OPC in Wildwood. So I wasn't away long. And the elder John Stevenson of the church was the director at the time I had worked for. So he would have me come in and teach apologetics every summer to the chapel staff. We always had interns at the chapel who they kind of crossed. You were to, if you're working at the chapel and you were a seminarian, you're usually an intern at Calvary OP Wildwood yeah. and doing the work at the chapel. So all of the interns for the next however many years were also – they were my intern and working at the chapel. So mm. it kept me working with staff, um, preaching there, doing apologetics. Um, I missed only one other summer. That was two thousand summer of 2004. I was being deployed with the Army because I ended up becoming an Army chaplain. I was deployed to the Middle East. So I spent one or two days there that summer just to say goodbye to everybody. I was heading off to the Middle East. And then the next summer started up again, helping with you know apologetics training. In 2011, I guess it was, 2012, Um the director was retiring and the committee called me in and just said, we, we know you've been kind of taking notes on the chapel. You've been observing it now since 1991. What suggestions would you have? Like what things would you change? And but we're talking to the interns and watching this for many years. I, I literally I had a whole notebook of all ideas from the chapel that I'd got from other guys who had served there and things laid it all out. And I didn't realize it was a job interview, but at the end of, <laughs> at, at, at the end of our time together, they said, that's exactly what we want. Like your vision for this is, is what we would love to do. Would you take the job as a director? So I started um, April 1st of 2013, I guess is when I started. And I've been the director since then. So I'm going on my 11th summer as the director um, wow. of the of the chapel itself. Now, uh, Jim, uh, explain a bit before Chris jumps in. I want to hear Chris, your, your interaction and introduction to the chapel too. But I'm a Midwesterner. I mean, a lot of people are listening are not necessarily from the East Coast, so we're not apprised to. I became more aware of this when I lived in Philadelphia for a while. The people from the East Coast, you know, many of them, not all, but many will typically have, you know, summer traditions where they might go to the coast or do various things. Out here, some people might go to Door County, Wisconsin or Lake Geneva or something like that. But can you explain a bit about the culture of going to the shore and if you could maybe give us a visual or express like what what's there like what is the boardwalk for people who might not even be aware of that 
Okay. Wildwood is about a six mile long barrier island on the southern tip of New Jersey. So we're 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 just about the la the southernmost of the beaches. The only thing south of us is Cape is the Cape beaches of Cape May themselves. Most of the beach communities around here are just that there, there's just beach and water and just like you think of any beach around the world. But at Wildwood and, and there's two other big boardwalks in New Jersey. It's just a long kind of wood plank kind of thing that goes. I think our boardwalk is about two miles long, and it has storefronts and then amusements. So if you think of the boardwalk runs parallel to the ocean, then you can walk up and down it. And then running out, perpendicular running out towards the ocean is all of the amusements. You have people from literally all over the world come and vacation here um, and also come to work summers here as well. It's been described, Wildwood, as a honky-tonk town. That it, it was known, It's it, some people call it the birthplace of rock and roll, Bill Haley and the Comets yeah. team. And they're, 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 they're Bruce Springsteen, not too far away, right? The Stone right? Pony is in the general vicinity. Yeah, that, it's about... Further away, but it's still in the yeah, area, right? 90 miles north. But yeah. the whole rock and roll culture... I mean, while people still come and look at what's called, if you think of, if you look up doo-wop culture or doo-wop architecture, there's still some of that here. Back in, you think, 50s and 60s, that was the heyday of Wildwood. When musicians would come in to play Atlantic City or other things, they would come to Wildwood. It was all these dance clubs and things. Over time, that's kind of gone away. We don't have as much as that anymore but it created kind of an atmosphere. We're one of the only free beaches in New Jersey. So people, we get a lot of day trippers from Philadelphia just come to spend the day at the beach. They walk the boardwalk. They go on the amusements. So the island goes from a off, off-season population of less than 10,000 to during the summer, we can have over 300,000 on the oh, island. Wow. So yeah. it gets huge. And most of the people, you know, they spend some time on the boardwalk, just walking up and, and down it and trying mm -hmm. all these different things out, you know, whether it's the amusements or the storefronts or getting getting candy or getting a slice of pizza. Mm -hmm. That becomes the hub of the community is really the boardwalk right on the shore there. Mm -hmm. um, and we just get a different clientele. You know, there's there's another boardwalk um, about 25 miles north, Ocean City. Ocean City, New Jersey was an old Methodist camp meeting town. It's a dry town. There's no alcohol. That's kind of a family resort. Wildwood is not, Wildwood is the closest thing to Wildwood is Seaside Heights. And if anybody's ever watched the, the, the TV show Jersey Shore, I've never watched that. <laughs> Seaside Heights. My, my mom and my right. sister lived in Seaside Heights, so I've gone up there a lot. And I actually was a ministerial advisor at OP Church in Seaside, yeah. and I went there a lot as a kid. Seaside is kind of New York's big kind of honky-tonk, rowdy, rock, and that's what and Wildwood is kind of Philadelphia is that. Those two are very similar. Our boardwalk is actually bigger in Wildwood, but those are kind of, so if you if anybody's ever watched Jersey Shore or heard about like the craziness that goes on the boardwalk, <laughs> that's, th that's exactly like what Wildwood is like too. It's it's just, it's the same kind of idea going on. Is it? Yeah, just an enormous party all, all summer long. Yes. I mean, maybe people that <laughs> haven't been to a boardwalk have been to Six Flags or something. I mean, if it wasn't just in a contained park. I mean, just imagine that on a two mile path on the yeah. shore. It's, it's like that. And so you end up with all these restaurants or arcades or, you know, on the shore, roller coasters, you name it, giant carnival. But then there's a the chapel and it's, it's about a hundred person seat. Just imagine a little chapel and the back of it is effectively a garage door that opens. Yeah. So when you're walking along the boardwalk, you're basically find yourself for a split second in the back of a you know, evangelistic church service. It's crazy. Chris, how did you get involved and in, in what was your first experience with the chapel? Yeah, I was, um, um, I heard of the Boardwalk Chapel. I had some friends in college that were on staff, but it, um, never really spent time there. Then uh, I went down with a church group uh, for a week um, in the summers of 20, uh, I think 2011, 2012, and 2013. And, um, so, you know, we spent a week there just uh, kind of helping keep the chapel open. Um, and this is sort of in the sort of previous iteration uh, under the former director. Um, so it, things look a little different now at the chapel. But uh, anyway, to 2013, um, I had just started uh, seminary, or I was just starting seminary at, at Westminster. And so Jim asked me, he said, hey, um, you know, we're kind of restructuring. I just started as a director, restructuring things a little bit looking for an evangelism intern 
um, would you like to come as a seminary and to, to be an intern? And um, I thought, okay, well, you know, I, I'd not done a lot of, you know, like evangelism, street evangelism. And I thought, uh, well, um, it's not my forte. It's something I always admire about, you know, guys who just effortlessly share the gospel with anybody. I wish you're more like that. This will be a good stretching experience. So I ended up coming in 2014 for the summer as the intern. And um, the Lord just really um, grew me tremendously uh, through that experience. And um, I uh, realized first, uh, just what a mission field we have here, uh, just in 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 in, in, the, in the U.S. Uh, how many people have not really heard the gospel articulated? How many people were open to having conversation about the gospel? That was very striking to me. I expected most people to be offended, very kind of put off. Um, and uh, I grew in sort of a boldness and a desire to to share. So, anyways, a great experience, and I um, so I ended up coming back uh, each summer throughout seminary. Um, so I know a lot of my classmates typically would do a, uh, a pastoral internship in the summer. I ended up coming back to the chapel for, uh, for, for four summers as a evangelism, um, coordinator, as we, we called it. Um, and then, um, after, and I, I continued, I guess that was 20, uh, 2018. I started my, um, I, I did a year long pastoral internship and, um, came back for a couple of summers to help with the evangelism training of the staff at the beginning of the summer interesting and um and then in 20 uh end of 2020 the committee approached me about uh coming back as a um a, a kind of a, a a associate director or director of evangelism um you know being um i guess one thing that we kind of saw as, as the chapel ministry was growing it's been growing in recent years um and jim especially you know being a full-time pastor of a church um, just there's so many pieces to kind of oversee um, that uh, they thought it would be a good idea to, to have, have someone to share the labor. So, and so I came on uh, as, as a guy who's kind of overseeing the evangelism ministry and evangelism training uh, of the chapel. And, and so I've been doing that since um, these past uh, several summers. Mm -hmm. Now, there's many uh, different feature articles on the Boardwalk Chapel people can find over at opc.org, things that have been published in some of our publications, namely New Horizons. Uh, but Jim or Chris, I was wondering if you could uh, maybe describe to us how the Boardwalk Chapel came to be in the first place and the, the vision and the work of Reverend Les Dunn. And, and how did this start? Was it, uh, uh, I mean, it, it's, it's quite an interesting story. Yeah, I'll let Chris um, tell the story up until when I took over and just say like how we've changed sure. the vision, like what has changed over time. But Chris has done a lot of work on looking at just the how did this all start, what went going. So yeah. Chris, if you could take, take it that. away. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I um, and I might ask you, Jim, to jump in in the sort of the, maybe John Stevenson days. But I, I, I um, it's really interesting. So Les Dunn is an OPC minister, and um, interestingly enough, he was actually a pastor here at uh, Grace and Westfield for a couple of years back in, I think, maybe the late 50s. Um, but he received a call to the OPC in Wildwood on the island there, Calvary, I think it was 1940, 1941. He got down there and um, saw just um, just the big swell, the, the, the enormous amount of people who vacationed there. And he saw um, just an opportunity for evangelism and witness uh, for the gospel. So he started uh, his first summer there. Uh, started going out on the beach. He, uh, with a couple of other ministers, started an outdoor service on the beach mm. um, as a kind of a, of a witness. Um, but because of the, of the noise of the surf and seagulls and just kind of moving the people, it just didn't seem like a good place. Yeah. So the next summer, they went up onto the boardwalk in a place at the uh, American Legion Pavilion, which was right on the boardwalk there, and uh, and would hold weekly services you know, preaching the gospel. And, um, well, the, uh, that lasted for a summer, the, because the owner of the American Legion who also owned the theater across the boardwalk, across the street from them, uh, were started complaining, uh, that they were harming the business because of the gospel, <laughs> of the theater, because of the gospel preaching. Was, so, it, was he also selling uh, silver idols with, of Artemis yeah. or something? <laughs> That's right. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's, so he, um, so he said, Hey, I've got, I've got a, um, 
and a, a, a storefront um, in the center of town. Uh, you know, no one's renting it because it was the middle of, of the war. We had just entered the war. It's the middle of the war now. Um, if you want to use that for free uh, next summer, you can. So they held meetings there. Um, and uh, then as um, the war started winding down, um, the, the following summer, um, they were renting that place out for $1,700 uh, to another place. So Leslie Dunn and his group of men got kicked out again. Um, so for uh, the, the next summer, Leslie Dunn just went up and down the boardwalk, handing out tracts uh, to people and kind of sharing the gospel. And uh, but the Lord put on his heart uh, you know, the, the, the need to have a permanent witness. So he started doing some kind of, uh, you know, investigation and realized there, that there was this one spot on the boardwalk where um he estimated 10,000 people would walk by over the course of an evening from like 7 to 11 p.m. on a, on a, on a pleasant summer evening. And uh, it was an open lot. So he went to the presbytery and uh, they were going to be auctioning that land off and asked the presbytery for a budget of, uh, you know, to, to purchase land. They gave him they gave him a budget of three thousand dollars. And uh, so he went to the auction and apparently some of the local business owners uh, weren't fond of the idea of having a church, sure. you know, a chapel, some religious you know, organization there preaching on, on the boardwalk. Um, and uh, so they went to the, the auction, uh, kind of driving the bidding up and trying to discourage him really from purchasing this uh, property. Apparently, the bidding was going up and slowed down and stopped right at uh, $29.50. And um, I think Jim told me uh, he had heard the the auctioneer uh, maybe had some kind of relationship with Les Dunn and, and so closed the bidding right at twenty nine fifty. <laughs> and uh, apparently afterwards, a, a wealthy uh, a business owner, Jewish business owner, secular Jewish business owner came up to him and offered him well above three thousand for the property. And Les said, Les Dunn, you know, said, no, no, thanks. You know, this is <laughs> uh, and. Um, it was, kind of, it was interesting reading, re, kind of reading about this. It was like Nehemiah, you know, people, these other guys, uh, these business owners were coming and telling, well, you're, you're never going to be able to get the money to build a building. You know, it's just, it's foolish. And, um, but uh, within a summer, uh, within a year, they had a, a chapel constructed and were holding services. And this is the summer of 1945, I believe now. Wow. Um, so that was kind of the, the, the history uh, of the chapel. And um, or the, or the, the begin the genesis of the chapel. Um, so then, for the next uh, you know ten fifteen years, um, they, they they held uh, throughout the summer these nightly services uh, with preaching and hymn singing, and um, they uh, guys from a lot of Westminster professors actually came down to, to preach. Um, they would take a vacation. There were some apartments at the back of the chapel there. And um, guys like uh, Meredith Klein, um, Ed Clowney, mm. um, uh, Van Til, Van Til wow. um, uh, Gaffin, um, those guys all came down for, for a week, you know, for years, mm -hmm. preaching, bringing the families. Um, in fact, uh, about six summers ago, you know, we were uh, I was there at the back of the chapel, just um, talking to people. And this older guy comes up to me, looks like he's in his maybe, you know, late sixties um, and said, you know, I haven't been back here in years, but I, my, my dad used to bring me down here as a kid and he would preach from here. So, oh, really nice to meet you. I'm, I'm Chris. What's your name? So, oh, I'm Sterling Klein. <laughs> oh, your, your dad was Meredith. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah that's it. So, um, and uh, so, and then in the 1960s, 70s, I don't know at what point, I think it was maybe the late 60s, early 70s, um, that uh, someone sort of got the idea of, of uh, bringing youth groups down um, to the Boardwalk Chapel to help out with the, um, the program. And um, in, in, the, in the late 60s, early 70s, kind of with the whole, you know, sort of the hippie days, um, the... Uh, some of what they did there at the chapel morphed a little bit. They had um, what they call rap sessions uh, where um, they would come and uh, just sort of kind of open up the floor for questions, you know, come, you know, you know, talk to a pastor about, about your questions. Um, and I think that partly grew out of um, one of the things Les Dunn discovered was 
um, his best evangelistic conversations happened after the services. Yeah. When people would hear the singing, hear the preaching, and, sure. and have questions, and he'd sit down. So, um, and then they started getting kind of uh, some some contemporary Christian music, as contemporary Christian music was sort of in its birth in the early seventies, um, and uh, and then um, so so it started sort of drawing more youth, uh, um, and I, I think some churches started bringing. Uh, youth groups down to participate in, in in these programs and in the sort of the daily ministry of the chapel. Um, and at what year? I don't know what year uh, uh, John Stevenson um, took over. I think it was the late is seventy seven or seventy eight. Yeah, it was. Uh, the, it, it was just before the nineteen eighties. So he took over from Len Chenu around that point. Okay, so yeah, under John Stevenson. Um, it kind of became a, a sort of a summer uh, missions experience for college students. And uh, they started inviting uh, these college students to come down to serve uh, a sort of a, a, a summer, uh, have a summer long experience serving as staff. Um, they would be trained in uh, evangelism and then uh, they would get day jobs. And, and at night they would come together, uh, rehearse a program with music, evangelistic drama skits uh and then they would have uh some uh a, a minister each week would give uh short kind of gospel uh messages and so um so the, i think under john stevenson uh uh the the chapel kind of developed this uh sort of um this missions experience for sure. uh for college students to come sort of the summer my wife and it did uh, something similar with, to that with campus crusade for christ you know 20 some years ago and uh that's a that's a model that's known to evangelicalism at least yes yeah in fact there's there's a crew campus crusade has something mm -hmm. similar here on there in in wildwood oh. and we've connected with them a little bit um yeah so um so john served as the the director uh, all the way up until 2013, when Jim uh, took over as uh, as the director, and um, uh, I can, I'll, I guess I'll let maybe Jim sure. talk about some of the changes and some of his vision and how uh, he's kind of uh, built on what's come before. Yeah, I'd love to hear it. Please go ahead. Uh, well, we saw for one, whenever when people would come before, they came as just generalists. So. You, you had to do music, you had to do skits, and you had to do evangelism. And some people only want, you get some seminarians who are like, I can't sing, I can't do, but I love doing evangelism. You get some singers would come, I love to sing, but I can't do evangelism, I'm scared to death. You know, some people who were drawn with you. And what I found was we were not getting as many people as you could if you let people just come and specialize as what they do well. And then mm -hmm. maybe dab on the others and learn a little bit. So I came up with the idea of let's just develop teams. But the bigger thing was, I thought of instead of just our mission being to the people out on the boardwalk, that's kind of what it was always focused like that. That was we're, we're here to minister to the people out there is so we've got an incredible opportunity to train young people to actually do evangelism and apologetics and that we needed to do it in a more systematic way. It was whichever seminarians came in, it was about like a bucket of like 30 different topics they were expected to teach. So they'd split them up between all the seminarians. So they were good topics to be done, but from every year, it was different. So there wasn't a, this is how we do it, and it's repeatable every year. So I, started, I thought, you know, what we really needed to do is have some kind of a curriculum, and let's focus on training the youth groups that come in every week in evangelism. Instead of it just being a beach retreat for a youth group, and they'll just help out at night. Let's make it like we're focusing. We're going to train you to do this all day, and then at night. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and and that's how so we started developing that and sort of growing after I think it was my after my first or second year, one of the guys we had is actually going to be here this summer, Isaiah English. He had been a student of Dr. Henry Cromadon at Covenant College, had gone on. And I had had a couple of guys over the years who had been at Covenant. They talked about Dr. Cromadon. I, I didn't know him at all. But at the end of, I think, the first summer, Isaiah said, you know, Dr. Krabadon goes to all these different events and he does evangelism. Would it be OK if he came here and just taught a little bit about evangelism? So that'll always help. I mean, I'm not a natural evangelist. I, I mean, I served as an evangelist in the military, um, but that's more of a pastoral kind of role than just out doing cold evangelism all the time. 
Dr. Krabben then came and that kind of changed everything. He's got his whole school of evangelism. He's got an entire curriculum, um, tracks that go with it, the whole thing. And I was like, this is something that is repeatable that you could just keep doing. So we really thrust Chris into the job of learning this from Dr. Krabadon. So mm-hmm. for about four or five years, Chris just kind of shadowed Dr. K when he was here and learned this stuff, Dr. K's whole approach. That freed me up to do my, my passion is more in terms of apologetics. So that allowed me to really focus on the apologetic side. So what we had a goal of becoming kind of the premier training station in lay apologetics and evangelism in the Northeast. That's kind of the goal that Chris and I have been working towards. So Chris and I kind of split the labors. Chris focuses in on the evangelism side of it and doing all the evangelism training. I focus on the apologetics training. So when the kids come out now, when they could like our staff, the first three weeks they're there, they get about 60 or so lectures in three weeks. Wow. between uh, on evan- evangelism and apologetics it's about four hours a day or more five days a week for three straight day three straight weeks hmm. and they get a, a, an in-depth training in that and then when the youth groups come in after that we train them they're there for five days so they get training on a kind of a, a scaled down level but they get training every day in evangelism and then in apologetics and then at night it becomes our laboratory so to speak like during the day you've got your classroom Here's evangelism and apologetics theory. Now let's go on the boardwalk and, and you'll see how this works in the real world. And that has worked very well. So our, our focus since I've taken over has kind of changed from being outwardly focused to the people on the board. We, we need to reach them. We still want to reach them, but it's been a little bit more internally focused. We, God has given us a great place to train people to do this and to try it out. And then you know, if we reach people on a boardwalk, that's wonderful. Now, yeah. the odd thing about it is by focusing on the training and not on the people outside, we've actually seen more professions of faith Yeah, because we've been doing it this way than when we're doing it the other way. And I think it's just because people are a little bit better prepared. Mm. And the biggest thing is real, and we could get into this at some point, what what really revolution every, uh, revolutionized everything was just the focus on prayer, which mm. which in one sense is kind of the, one of those duh moments. <laughs> but when you're really focusing on prayer specifically for evangelism and apologetics and doing it in a methodical way, instead of just, okay, well, before we go out, we should all pray and do that. Um, it really revolutionized things. And we, we went from seeing maybe five people make a profession of faith each summer. And like I said, I was involved from 91 on that's pretty typical about, you know, five, maybe 10 on a good summer. Once we started using Dr. K's stuff and, and doing the training and especially focusing on prayer, we started seeing 50 to 60 converts per summer. Wow. So you know, made a tenfold increase. And really the only difference was really focusing on prayer mm-hmm. as a backbone of what we do. So we usually say we have a three pronged approach, you know, we following the traditional, you know, the three parts of saving faith, you know, knowledge, ascent, and trust. Under mm-hmm. knowledge, what do we do? Well, we do evangelism. We, we, People need the data. We proclaim the gospel under ascent. How do we help, help people towards ascent? Well, we do apologetics. We seek to take away the intellectual barriers and things. Yeah. But when it comes to trust, there's nothing we could do. It's the work of the Holy Spirit. So what we do is we pray, we pray that the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit. Mm-hmm. would do that work and change hearts. So that's our three prongs to our ministry is is just uh, evangelism, apologetics, and prayer. That's great. I love that approach uh, of training. I'm so glad to hear that you know the emphasis on training has also ended up <laughs> improving the effectiveness there uh, on the boardwalk. However, it's also a wonderful thing because if you're teaching people to fish, uh, you're they're also going back to their own locations wherever they may be and can replicate that. Uh, maybe not in the exact same context, but they certainly have a training and a framework that they can use to evangelize and engage in apologetics with people in their particular communities. Yeah, we've yeah. seen that. Youth groups have especially gone home and mm. then said, we want to do this back at home with our church. We've had people on staff after spending a whole summer, they've gone back to their church and maybe the church doesn't do anything in evangelism. And they said, well, let me find one or two other like-minded people and get together and start praying with them about evangelism. And then maybe let's go to the mall once a month and do yeah. evangelism. So we've seen that carry. And that's really what Chris and I have been striving towards is 
getting people trained during the summer. So you're practicing. This is wonderful. You know, you're out there doing it, but now go home and bring this back to your church right. and you could show them how to do it. If nothing else, just kind of light a fire under them of, you know, that we need to be doing evangelism. Mm -hmm. And it's not, and it's not even just the, the staff and the, um, the, uh, the youth groups and, and the staff and the seminarians, but even pastors who come out for a week, you know, have a number of them have kind of made the comment after a week there at the chapel. Wow, this is really refreshing. It's kind of giving me sort of a fresh sort of vision for evangelism in our church and, and, you know, how to, to start reaching, uh, you know, our community and, um, and that to kind of underscore what Jim, Jim was saying, um, you know, that, that's one of the reasons I'm still involved in the, in the chapel and really passionate about the ministry. Uh, it really is. A, it's an amazing seed sowing ministry. And, uh, and maybe we'll have time to share a couple of, of examples mm. of how God has used that. Uh, in fact, I know of at least two OPC ministers who were converted through the Boardwalk Chapel, including Tim Ferguson, the one I'm working with now. Um, and uh, but. Yeah. I, I think, uh, as Jim was saying, uh, one of the the um, really the um, benefits of the Boardwalk Chapel and uh, one of the things that makes it such a gem is, I think, the opportunity to train, to equip, uh, and to, as he said, light light the fire of evangelism in in the church. Um, and that that was kind of a that has been a burden of mine over, over the years, um, particularly because of my involvement at the chapel. To see the the reform our reform churches more evangelistic, and um, you know, kind of sometimes a uh, you know the the old joke. Well, pe people get saved by the Baptists and Pentecostals, and then when they start reading the Bible and, and wanting to get you know deeper into the Word, they end up in the Reform Church. Um, and you know, I'm thinking, well, you know, why can't we be um, gathering in the lost as well? You know. Um, and uh and and i've really seen the the impact that the chapel has had on people who come for a week or a summer uh and then and and go back home with a new uh desire to um to to witness to evangelize and start partnering with with you know the others in their church to pray to that end it's amazing well uh, what are some of the typical opportunities you've spoken about uh, seminarians and youth groups and other people that are coming to be able to be trained. And in the past, you've had ministers that have visited and have been preaching and actively involved. What are currently in its current form, the, the opportunities for people to get involved and how could they, how could they get involved? We, um, people could be on, we have paid positions. So we have, we try to take on two to three seminarians every summer to do an evangelism internship and they work directly under Chris. Um, and those are, those are paid positions. We have a couple positions for young ladies to, as room leaders in our dorms and they come, those are scholarships. So we don't pay them, but they don't have to pay anything to be here. And their job is to mentor the girls in their rooms. The, the seminary interns mentor, mentor the guys. Then we hire a girl who does all of our domestic stuff. So cooking all the meals in the dorm. We're like, you know, that's important in a ministry. You, you know, the people need to eat. So and she's been mentoring other girls. We're like, you know, look, my gift is homemaking and things like that. But I want to use it for the Lord. It's like, well, come and use it, yeah. you know, you know, there. And she's in, she's working with, with them. Um so we have those leadership positions and, and like I said, those are paid and we started junior staff programs. We have two junior staff counselors, a male and a female. So those are paid positions as well. Um, then we have just anyone, regardless of the age, could come and be on summer staff um, and spend the whole summer. So that's depending on how long they could come for a couple of days or for the whole summer. So we have a, a, a kind of sliding scale of what it costs to come for the summer. We are, we usually look at what does campus crusade charge? Cause that's the closest <laughs> apples to apples. Yeah. And, and I'll just say this, we charge a lot less. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I have great appreciation for crew. My, my brother sure. worked for crew in wild with the same, same summer. I was in wild with my yeah. nephew worked for crew was come back and work for us this summer. Um, but people could come, like I said, usually the minimum is will come for a week. Um, or they could come for the whole summer. If they go for the whole summer, they could work locally during the day and then be involved in the programs every night. We have a the junior staff program we instituted is for people who are 16 and 17 year olds. It's four, four week iterations. We do two iterations. And that's a much more intensive discipleship 
for kids that age to get to try each one of the different teams. So the evangelism team, the music team, and the drama team. So to get a feel for what it's like to be on, on full-time staff. And we still have openings for that for this for the summer for both iterations. And that's I think two thousand dollars for the for the four weeks. Um, and then for youth groups, youth groups could come in. We they usually come in on a Saturday and say for a week, leave the next Saturday. I think it's um I think we're up to about it's either three or four thousand dollars for the youth group to come in for the week. But when you figure you could handle a group of twenty or more kids, the, the per person price isn't all that much. And then we train them throughout the week. We put them into programs each night. Um, that we've been getting a very good response to, to where we're kind of booking almost two years out now for youth groups. We also have Christian bands come in every Saturday oh, night. Wow. The, Saturday is the staff's day off. So we have Christian bands coming in, playing music every Saturday. So at least we have something going on at the chapel. Mm -hmm. And then we'll kind of rotate through with some of our evangelists to be passing out tracks on Saturdays as well we even have some youth groups like you know chris will i'll be talking to you about this one we just had i just got off the phone with a pastor before we got on here who wants to be from new jersey just wants to bring a group down on a saturday to do evangelism with us for the day so there's lots of opportunities like i said from just coming down for a day and jumping into what we're doing to actually being here all summer on our website it has the cost for all the different things great we've had a, a lot of people have come for two, say, i'm just coming for a week or i'm coming for two weeks and then they come and spend the rest of the summer. Um, <laughs> you talked about Emily earlier. So she does all her PR stuff. Her original thing, she was coming for two weeks and then going home. She came after the first week. She's like, okay, next week I'm going to go home. I'm going to put in my two weeks notice at my job and I'm coming back. And she has not only remained at the chapel, but now she's been working for me at the chapel for like the last three, four years. So the students tend to just love being here. The sense of community among the young people who are at the house. Um, so there's lots of opportunities. We do have two dormitories, one guy's, one girl's dorm, and we can fit about 20 in each dormitory. Wow. When they come, we we pri provide for their meals and everything like that. Everything's, all the meals, training, everything's included in, in the price. Chris, mm -hmm. I don't know if you have anything else you want to share about the opportunities we have. Um, so the, the train, we were speaking uh, earlier about training. Yeah. And um, that's, that's another uh, opportunity we have. Um, and... Again, um, it's such an ideal training ground because you, you're in the chapel there, um, you know, talking about sort of uh, evangelism, the theology of, of evangelism, apologetics. Uh, and then you have um, the most wonderful field, you know, sort of training ground for a, a field for, 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 uh, for practical training um, right in, in the backyard. And you put the stuff into practice immediately. So um, the first uh, the first week of June, we have the School of Evangelism, mm -hmm. um, which is the staffs, uh, the, the the primary evangelism for the staff, or primary training for the staff in evangelism. Um, but that's also open to uh, you know to, to anyone who wants to register and come. Um, so that's a full week of uh, evangelism training. There's uh, close to to twenty sessions. Um, on evangelism, um, you know, what is uh, the role of prayer in evangelism? Uh, what is the mission of the church? Um, how does, you know, even a lesson on the theology of the Holy Spirit and how that um, connects to evangelism and the mission of the church. Um, so it's kind of a, you know, a, a, a full orbed course with plenty of practice. And the great thing about it is you're going out and you're doing evangelism with um, seasoned evangelists. Yes. Uh, so you can, you know, have never spoken to someone you know a stranger about jesus before and and go out there and sort of see it modeled and then the second and third weeks um a, a jim does his apologetics trainings broken up into, into two weeks mm -hmm. um i think right now those are kind of booked with uh with with church groups or youth groups um, and then at the end of the summer um we have uh we've started doing uh, an evangelism conference um which is similar to the school of evangelism there's a lot of overlap, but it's a little more geared towards um, evangelists or pastors, elders, um, church leaders, church planters, um, and so. And you know, there's there's discussion uh, about um, uh, you know uh, what are you doing in your church? You know how how uh, as a church uh, do you encourage a culture of evangelism? What are out you know ways of reaching out to the community? Um, and so it's uh, that's the last week of, of August, right before the week before uh, Memorial Day. Labor Day. Yeah. Yeah. 
It's amazing. So those trainings, um, and uh, you can go on the website to to see more yeah. information about those and to register. We'll um, have a link to that in the episode description. I'm looking at the website now, a beautiful website, but you head on over to boardwalkchapel.org. I'll have a link to that in the episode description. But it's a very w- clean and well-organized website that has information on all this. There's a There's a main menu item called training, and right under there you'll see links for School of Evangelism or Apologetics Training or the Evangelism Conference. And then there are registration forms. So if people have some interest, uh, you certainly can contact people through the website, but you can also uh, fill out the form to register for any of these. And then there's also a blog and all sorts of other information available right on the website. But it's really tremendous. I, I think this is amazing. I think there ought to be more people uh, that want to send groups from their church, but also ministers and, and aspiring ministers and elders out there that really should just carve out a week and go visit, bring your family with you. I mean, there's all sorts of things to do, even if you're going in for, for training and maybe your family isn't, whatever. I'm sure they'll occupy their time. <laughs> they'll have a good time. And then, you, you know, you can take the lessons that you learn there, put them to use while you're there under supervision and with uh, with several other co-laborers who are doing the same and people with many, many years of experience that can help you along with the particular challenges that you may encounter, but then take that home and engage that in your own local ministry. I can't think of much else, some other opportunities, uh, a good way to spend your time and your resources, especially in the summer, than going over to the Boardwalk Chapel in Wildwood, New Jersey. It's amazing. Mm. We've yeah. also found it's a helpful thing for people who've gone to like in the OPC to Timothy conference and things like that. Sure. Um, it's a great way to test if you're a high school young man, college young man mm. who's thinking the Lord might be calling me to ministry. I'm not sure. I, I know from going to Bible college and seminary, how many people who went thinking they were called to ministry, spent all this money on college and seminary mm. only to get out and say, actually get into an internship and say, I'm not called to ministry. This mm-hmm. isn't for me. Um here you get to come. We we have people sharing the gospel every single night. So we have little gospel mess moments. We call them throughout the, the program at night. So some young man was like, okay, we will help you put together a three to five minute gospel presentation. Get used to speaking in front of people. See if it's yeah. something like, is the Lord blessing yeah. this? Are you growing in your ability? We had one man, young man come. He had gone to the Timothy conference. He spent the summer. He says, this was a great opportunity for me. I realize the Lord's not calling me to ministry. I, I thought I was, but after doing this all summer, I still want to serve the Lord, but I realize this isn't my vocation. There, there's so much more that goes on in ministry that I really don't have a calling for. We've had other people ended up becoming ministers or missionaries in the OPC after coming here because they're getting that opportunity. Just think the, the typical internship, maybe your summer internship, you might fill the pulpit eight to 12 times all summer. We could do that inside of three weeks because we could put, because we literally have a program seven nights a week in which we're having people speak and give short little messages um, every single night. So there's such an opportunity to just keep trying. And since the audience is always changing, you could just use the same message over and over (laughs) and over, but you're just getting that experience of you get over the jitters of being in front of people. You're getting used to, you know, forget having to preach at a church where children are crying. You've got drunk people screaming in. If you preach at the chapel, you can handle any kind of distraction inside of a church. Um, But it's a great opportunity for people to kind of test out their gifts and see what they're good at and see how the Lord might use them. We had people come, like we had a girl who was a graduated from college as a voice major, incredible singer, jazz singer. She came the first summer and she was on the music team. She came back the second summer and said, you know what? I want to be on the evangelism team because that's what what I do professionally is music. But I realized the Lord has given me a gift for evangelism to share the gospel. and, And this is where I get to do that. We've seen other people do the same thing, thinking they were gifted in one thing. And then as the summer went along, they realized, you know, the Lord has really given me a burden and a heart and a gift for this other thing. And yeah. until I did it, I would have never thought so. Mm-hmm. We had a girl who was great at evangelism. She started off working in the kitchen. And she said she did that because she was afraid of evangelism when she first came. But once she got trained and went out a few times, I had her come back as one of our female, female. Um, evangelism leaders um, to help talk. Because what we try and, and we don't believe in female evangelists in the ordained sense. But what we found on the boardwalk is it's helpful to have guys talk to guys and girls talk to girls. Mm -hmm. So you don't have kind of this flirty fishing kind of thing or 
people have a, a an attraction or you know to someone of the opposite and they'll sit and talk to you because of that so we try to right. have guys talk to guys and girls for girls so we try to have some female leaders helping the girls do evangelism to other girls sure that makes total sense what are some of the particular needs as we're you know maybe wrapping up thinking about how we can pray for the ministry of the boardwalk chapel but also some people may want to support not only attending themselves, but support financially or support in other ways. Uh, what are some of the things that are on your heart and the particular needs that the mission, uh, the ministry has at the moment? The biggest thing is manpower in terms of staff. We have all the leaders we need for this year, but we still have beds open throughout the summer. So my prayer each day is the Lord would give us one staff member for every bed throughout the summer and one student for every bed during the training weeks. Um, it's not just because it helps to pay the bills, but we want to max use as much as the chapel for as many people as mm -hmm. possible. Yeah. So if you have a young person, you know, they're getting ready to go to college, it's a great opportunity for them to learn how to interact with other worldviews and to share their faith, and to defend their faith, to get grounded in their faith. Um, Money is like with any ministry, as you know, I mean, it takes money to run these things, uh, to do this, especially yeah. with inflation. Just our food costs have gone through the through the roof. Um, and then we always need we I don't Chris may know better about how many Bibles and pieces of Christian literature we give away in any given summer. But we we, we try to get stocked up with Bibles to give away and literature. But by the end of the summer, we're out of it because a lot of that goes out. We could always use donations of Bibles and Christian literature as well. Yeah, the, the past couple of summers, we've probably uh, handed out about a thousand Bibles wow. and Gospels of John. And uh, we certainly could have handed out more. So that's that's a great way if, uh, if people want to help by donating and purchasing Bibles um, or... Uh, and also these little, you know, Gospels of John, which are very easy to, to, to hand out. Um, that's a great way to support the work of the chapel. Um, also, uh, we have a track, a rack, um, and, and uh, where we keep not only tracks, but little booklets. Um, some of the, um, like, biblical counseling and CCEF uh, resources on different topics. Uh, if, if people want to purchase some of those uh, regarding issues like anger, addiction, mm -hmm. homosexuality, um, you know, those are things we can keep stock that people walking along, whether they're believers or unbelievers, yeah. uh, can, can grab and, uh, and be helped and even led to Christ through. So those are, those are some needs from the evangelism side. Perfect. Yeah. I'm looking, uh, again at the website, if you go to boardwalkchapel.org and then under connect, you can click the contact form as well. If people have some thoughts or ideas, I presume that these are good places to, or good ways to connect. If you have uh, some donations you would like to arrange, uh, there's an administrative as, uh, assistant contact as well as a director's email and director's phone number there. I'll just leave it there uh, and put a link to that in the episode description for people that may want to follow up. But brothers, this has been a fun and a really enlightening conversation. Do you have any other uh, final words or calls to action or, or parting thoughts that you'd like to impress upon people? I would encourage people, um, number one, to pray. Yeah. Uh, and number two, to, um, to come down and our, you know, cause you, you look at the news, you look around at your, your classmates, no, you know, uh, neighbors, coworkers, but, you know, we are in need of a, a, a revival, a movement of, of the spirit um, of which the gospel, the word of God and the gospel is the, is the agent, you know, is the, the means of the spirit. So, um, uh, the boardwalk chapel is very strategically placed for sowing the seed of the gospel. Um, and the Lord can use the conversations, the preaching that's coming from the chapel, even the, some of the street preaching we do on the, um, uh, on the boardwalk itself to plant the seeds of the word. Uh, and these people can wind up in, in our churches. Um, I, I wanted to share, uh, it, since we've been on social media, we've received some really oh, neat, wow. uh, in, encouraging responses. Um, you know, when you're out sharing day in and day out, sometimes you can ask yourself, well, you know, how effective are we, you know, what's, are we accomplishing anything mm -hmm. lasting through this? And we've got some really encouraging, uh, emails just this past year, we had a guy uh, that he wrote, uh, dear boardwalk chapel. I wanted to let you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. 
22 years ago, I was 19 years old, just graduated from high school and was partying for senior week just down the street from you. I was in spiritual turmoil and there was an intense battle raging for my soul. Although I did not speak to anyone at the chapel, the sign on the front of the chapel, which has John 14, 6 on it, was very important to my life. I was so lost and confused, but I remember reading Jesus' words, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And I stood there thinking, wishing, praying, oh, how I want that to be true. God used that sign in a powerful way in my life. A few days later, I gave my life to Christ. And now here I am, 22 years later, a pastor of a growing Bible-believing Reformed Church in Iowa. Wow. Thank you for your labors in the Lord and for trusting in the life-giving message of Jesus Christ to save people from sin, death, and hell. Mm. Michael Schover, Reverend mm. Michael Schover. So um, those are the things that, that God uh, can do. We, we also received another email from, uh, from some parents talking about uh, two summers ago, they had a, a son said he's lost they they shared you know they, they witnessed to him or evangelized him for uh, a number of years but he talked to someone at the chapel there god used that planted a seed that flourished and uh, he he turned to christ and uh so they they wrote in just to thank us for um the ministry the gospel ministry there so um but that's the work of the holy spirit and going back to prayer um we appreciate and really covet the prayers of god's Amen. people um that as the word is is the seed of the word is sown mm. that God would bring forth fruit from it. Yeah, we could also, you know, something you don't think about, but the, the history from the chapel with having Van Til, Klein, others, we could use academics like yourself, Camden, or others, <laughs> seminary professors who would like to come and actually do some training with the staff. Mm. We had some people from Harvest USA Ministries. Yes, wonderful. Um, that we had one of the, one of our staff members, her dad was the director there for a while. He came for two years and did training and how to witness um, to people in the homosexual movement. We had another PCA man who's done did his doctoral work on same sex attraction. He came down and worked with us. So there's always opportunities for people who really are. Spe I mean, Chris and I are kind of generalists, but guys who have really specialized in some of these areas to come down and train the students. We can always slot people in there and use that. It's it's an opportunity to to for people to use their gifts a bit. So if you ever want to come down, you know, other guys yeah. who are interested in apologetics, evangelism, theology, there, there's always a place for them here mm. and for us to use them in training the young people that are here for the summer. Praise yeah. the Lord. Yeah, I'm not going to, uh, I was just going to say, I'd love to follow up with you. Perhaps we have another episode down the road where we where we discuss in more specifics the details of the, the training program, obviously not doing the whole training program during an episode, but talking more nuts and bolts. But that sounds tremendous. And I'll challenge, uh, I'd like to challenge everyone out there, even as I challenge myself, you know, it's one thing for us to read about apologetics or, debate these things in terms of our method and, you know, what's the appropriate apologetic method or getting into various arguments and these sorts of things at a theoretical level, that's important. But if we're not putting it to use, what, what do we, what do we spend our time on? I'm not a pragmatist yeah. here, you know, and just mm -hmm. in terms of looking at what works and that's the only thing of value at the same time, like, what does it say for us? If we, if we spend so much time reading about and thinking about apologetics, but we're not actually giving a, a, a defense for the reason for the hope yeah. that we have within us. Yeah. I mean, to our Amen. shame, we need to get out there and do those things. This is a wonderful mm -hmm. opportunity. So I hear what you're saying, Jim, and I think there's a great opportunity for people to come and per, perhaps be able to train in a certain way. But maybe a lot of those people, myself included, need to go and get trained first mm -hmm. <laughs> in doing it. And then maybe marrying the two together, so more of the theoretical side to actually putting things into practice, but the, 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 the opportunity is there. So the, the fields are white for the harvest, are they not? We, yes. the, but the mm -hmm. laborers are few. So pray to the yeah. Lord of the harvest that we could send out more laborers. We have open beds, open beds. We want to fill those beds. So pray to the Lord for that. And uh, if you have any interest whatsoever, uh, please contact uh, boardwalkchapel.org for information on how you can get connected or how maybe you can share and pass on this information to someone else or to people at your church who may be interested. But we'll have links to all that in the episode description. And again, excuse me, if you have any questions or follow-up, head on over to boardwalkchapel.org where you can send us a note at mail at reformedforum.org. If we can't answer the question, we'll try to put you in touch with someone who can 
Uh, but this has been wonderful. So thank you so much, Jim and Chris. We really appreciate you taking the time today to, to share with us. It's been a joy. Yeah, thanks thanks for having so us. much for having us. Yeah, it's, it's been a joy. It's been my pleasure. Uh, head on over to the website and uh, follow up online with all the information. But uh, I do want to thank everybody for listening and for watching. And we hope you join us again next time on Christ the Center.